I will welcome everybody again. Here's two weeks in a row. So super excited. We wanted to get another webinar out there, more information to empower you to heal before we head into the holiday week next week. So we're going to talk a little bit different perspective here, talking about thyroid, not thyroid cancer, but thyroid and how it affects cancer. A tale of two environments. I've given this presentation before, but I think it's a very, very important uh, topic because our patients that come to us, they often wonder, well, well why, am, why do I need to help my thyroid? What, what's really going on there? And the research, again, always leads the way always leads the way. There are two environments and those environments can dictate different effects with the same uh, hormone here. Here we're talking about thyroid in the body. That is body with cancer. So I am Dr. Goodyear. I'm the medical director here at Brio Medical. We are in the beautiful Scottsdale, Arizona, actually chilly Scottsdale, Arizona. Yes, it does get chilly here in the desert. Here at Brio Medical, we are a natural, holistic, integrative cancer healing center. You've probably heard this before, but I think we've got to continue to stress this. The science leads the way on the use of natural therapies, the use of holistic perspective. That is understanding our, our goal here is to heal the whole and then use integrative uh, therapies in the process there to achieve that objective. You know, I'm a, both a medical do uh, doctor as well as a medical doctor homeopath here at Brio Medical. We have a great team here for you. So when we look at thyroid and cancer, it's really a, a tale of two environments. And I want to really, want to really advocate that we think outside the box because the science is there. We just got to let our understanding go there and understand this doesn't just apply to, to thyroid. Now, when we look at history, it's really interesting. I love history. And if you hear me talk you, 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 and you read any of my writings, History always gives us perspective, whether that's the origin of words, the means of communication, but history never lies. It's only people that lie about history. So always looking back at history, it's important to really help us to lay the future as we move forward. And that also applies to science. So when we look at thyroid, our understanding of thyroid, it's interestingly enough, it's not really a new one. Uh, first treatment of goiter with minced thyroid glandular was in all the way back in the 1470s. So a little bit a while ago. Uh, you look at thyroxin was developed via Glaxo in 1949, all the way around to the verification of reverse T3 in 1977. But I want to focus on the 1976 because that's what we're talking about today. What's called non-thyroidal illness syndrome. That's when this was first described. And we'll talk about what that means and how that impacts and focuses on the treatment of cancer, because it may surprise you how this looks. So what we're dealing with in the body with cancer is really two different environments. Everybody looks at the process of cancer and they think that cancer, when a person has cancer, the whole body's cancer. But in reality, that's not true. There are definitely pockets of cancer and tumor microenvironment and immune dysfunction, but there's more healthy environments. It's when that, that balance tips in favor of the can, uh, cancer that really the body starts to decline and decline rapidly. So we have two environments, we have two signaling, but all in the same organisms. And this concept doesn't just exist as it relies, relays to thyroid here. It also applies to vitamin C. I've talked about this in other areas, in other lectures at conferences, where the literature on vitamin C in cancer cells shows that it has a much longer half-life in the cancer cells related to healthy cells. In fact, when you look at the blood, when you look at the uh, liver cells of healthy cells, you're going to see a much shorter half-life. In fact, it's all eliminated in 16 hours. That is vitamin C. But in cancer cells, up to 48 hours, there's still a significant uh, level of vitamin C present within that cancer cell and cancer environment. Two different environments, two different effects, two different half-lives. This also applies to melatonin, applies to photodynamic therapy, applies to CBD, medical cannabis. So this dualistic principle, if you will, really ripples through the physiology of the body. So we're talking about two environments here cancer tumor microenvironment, 
but then the non-tumor microenvironment might also know that is healthy. I want to move a little bit faster here so that it doesn't go as long as we did the other night. And I touched last week about precision and accuracy. Being holistic and natural and integrative actually is following the science. It's precision and it's accurate. And remember, the word accuracy means a conformity to truth, meaning eliminating of non-truth. So being precise and accurate, that's what we're after here. So what we're looking at here is, is a picture, an image of the tumor microenvironment. And our understanding of how cancer exists is really changing drastically. And that's for the good for patients. The, it used to be thought that cancer was really just a solid ball of cells isolated from the body that no longer applies. We now understand it is a, an environment where there are cancer cells, there are healthy cells, and there's this kind of gray zone, this environment that coalesces and coexists. And that's really the, the battlefront, if you will, where these many different cell types you see listed are interacting, and this is where cancer is manipulating its environment to grow, but this is also where the body's trying to protect against it. Again, these environment, this environment is existing within the context of the body of normal, healthy environment. And so what we have to recognize is that cancer, the environment in and around cancer is really changing. And our, the impact and the effect of the immune system in that environment is also changing. This is giving us a change in perspective of how to approach cancer all in that tumor microenvironment. And it gives us a change in understanding and thus it needs to force us into a change in, in thinking. And here in this webinar, we're gonna be talking about that change of thinking as it applies to, to thyroid. So just a little bit of perspective here. This was a study, 2019, looking at the different effects of overactive thyroid versus underactive thyroid in the tumor microenvironment. Overactive thyroid, increasing natural killer cell activity, reducing myelo-derived suppressor cells. These are uh, cells that are attracted to the tumor microenvironment that suppress the immune system within that context of the tumor microenvironment. Hyperthyroid, increasing CD8 T lymph cells. Think of these as like your Marine or your Army, cytotoxic T lymphocytes and many of them versus hypothyroidism, we actually see an increase in regulatory cells. These are immunosuppressive as well, decrease in natural killers. So in a general term, simply looking at overactive thyroid, underactive thyroid, they are gonna elicit different effects immunologically in the tumor microenvironment. And it's called non-thyroidal illness syndrome. The very first study that mentioned this was actually published in 1978. So we're, we're talking about a, a long time, this is not something new, but for many, it is a new concept and a new phrase to learn. So when we look at non-thyroidal illness syndrome, we have to recognize that what we're talking about here is a very different mechanism of signaling. And particularly it's, it's involving just a few, re, uh, few different types of receptors, but particularly what's called integrin alpha V beta three. This receptor would we'll touch on just a second, really allows thyroid to stimulate a cell non-genomically. And just a, a very summary process here, non-genomically T4 stimulates cancer growth via this non-genomic signaling pathway. T4 is what most those, most of those with low thyroid take as a pill, synthroid or levothyroxine. That is a, synth, a synthetic T4. Reverse T3 also stimulates cancer growth via this same signaling pathway. Whereas T3 can actually be used to counter this non-genomic signaling that cancer will take advantage of. So it's really about genomic versus non-genomic. And I actually have a whole series of talks going through many different hormones and recognizing the genomic versus non-genomic signaling and how that's effect, affecting and impacting cancer. So I think it's again, always good to step back and take a kind of 30,000 foot perspective and kind of get a, a lay of the land, if you will, of what this signaling really looks like. And what you can see is uh, up there in that left-hand corner, T4, T3 binding to that red designation alpha V beta three, that is a non-genomic receptor. There are normal thyroid receptors. 
Over to your right, you see what's called T3 binding to TR alpha. It's actually in the cytoplasm of the cell. That would be the classic, classic genomic signaling, which goes down and binds to the DNA. You see uh, represented within that circle, oblong blue circle, um, with what looks to be the coiled up genetic material of the DNA. So this is a, a stark contrast of signaling, but it's the same thyroid hormones affecting the signaling pathway very, very differently. And in a way, much of this can be utilized by the cancer. Cancer is taking normal cellular pathways and using them for its own benefit and the healthy body's detriment. In many ways, it's, it's kind of like a, it's kind of like a parasite. It's, it's taking advantage of its environment. So when we look at genomic syst, uh, signaling, we have to understand what it is to compare and contrast non-genomic, which is how thyroid can be used to stimulate cancer growth. And this non-genomic signaling, as I mentioned just a reference a few minutes ago, can also be applied to estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, many different types of hormones. So it's not just isolated here to thyroid. But when we look at non-genomic signaling, this too also applies to many of these different hormones. And I would say probably we're only beginning to understand the impact of this secondary or alternative signaling. So when somebody says, well, I have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, so I need to make sure my estrogen levels aren't normal. Again, beyond the estrogen, we have to understand the estrogen metabolites, which I've talked before. So check out our YouTube page uh, for, with a previous webinar. But we also have to recognize that non-genomically that estrogen that's present can also be signaling cancer growth. And I'm going to blow your mind here in a little bit because thyroid can actually stimulate estrogen receptors. You heard me right. So when we look here at thyroid, we have to understand a brief review of hormone review, hormone metabolism, metabolites, receptors, and then the non-steroidal impact. So when we think of thyroid, this is what we as Americans are trained to think. We're trained to think of medication. Of course, armor thyroid is a desiccated form of T4, T3. Synthroid and levothyroxine are your commercial conventional T4 uh, synthetic type hormones. So when we look at this, this is what most people, when they, th they think of, when they think of hormone, but in fact, that's really not what hormone physiology is all about. The way we're trained today is to look at hormones here in thyroid in a very sequential, simplistic overview of thinking. TSH stimulates thyroid hormone. It's that simple. There's no variations. There's no variability. There's no counterthought. And in fact, this is very limited in, in, in process. In fact, it's very, it's oversimplified. When I tell people it's complex, people say, well, brevity is a soul of wit. And I'm always like, well, that's true, but nobody's trying to be witty here. We're trying to be precise and accurate. And in turn, we have to understand that the complexity in fact does exist. And this is not a linear process. So I want to step back real quick and look at two words, disease versus disease, and ask the simple question, does disease exist? Because what is disease? When you break it into its root word, dis and ease, that word literally means lack of wellness. So today, whatever ICD-10 code that, that your doctor you know, puts on your billing, your EOB billing sheet that then gets submitted to your insurance, whatever that disease name comes about, it literally means there's a lack of wellness. There's a lack of optimal function. There's a lack of healing in that particular area of physiology, of biochemistry, and that's what you're seeing. And so that's why a focus on healing, a focus on wellness is really, it's really what's, what's needed today because a focus of disease really just focuses on managing disease. It never focuses on anything beyond that. There is the complexity. There ain't no brevity about that. Sorry to pull out the old Louisiana vernacular. This is the complexity of thyroid. So we have to recognize it, we have to understand it, and we just have to get, get after it and, and work within it. So when we look at thyroid metabolism, 
a little bit simplistic here. And again, I got the references there, so I encourage you to check it out because I want you to not take my word for it, but read, read it for yourself and empower yourself. Thyroxin, which is T4, there's the uh, organic chemical structure. Uh, little nightmares for those of you who maybe had organic chemistry a time or two. But what you see is it can convert it to reverse T3 or T3. These are all thyroid, act, uh, thyroid hormones, but according to the way medicine approaches it, T4, thyroxin, is the only one. But that's not the case. Beyond just the T4, we would have to look at T3 and reverse T3 as metabolites, but they're thyroid hormones. But the rest of these over on the, the left column and reverse T3 there is repeated. These are also thyroid metabolites. And again, metabolites are just breakdown products of the parent compounds. And it used to be that thought that they, they did not have metabolic activity, but we now know they clearly have metabolic activity. They have disruptive metabolic activity. And in processes of lack of wellness, such as in cancer, in many ways, this can be utilized by these abnormal growing cells. I always like to put words of authors out of studies out there to, so as to not take it my word, but to put their words out of there in the research. And I think this is a really good quote from just a few years ago in 2019. Quote, reverse T3 is physi physiologically relevant to thyroid economy, meaning overall thyroid function in the body. However, its clinical use as a biochemical parameter of thyroid function is very limited. Currently, no evidence supports the use of reverse T3 to monitor levothyroxine therapy, either given alone or in combination with leothyronine. I would say this is a, a, a incredibly oversimplified statement, and they completely lack an understanding of this concept of dualistic principle. They're looking at it simply through the model of, I'm giving Synthroid, I'm giving levothyroxine, what do I follow? That's it. Not recognizing that the body doesn't work in that linear sequential process. So when we look at thyroid hormones, you know, obviously this is an overrepresentation here of, what, of the thyroid gland. You know, trying to keep it simple, T4, T3, and reverse T3, and even T2 is what we can focus on as it relates to non-thyroidal illness syndrome. And we have to recognize that, that thyroid hormones are really, they're a flow. They're a flow of hormones. And those hormones are dictated by enzymes, which are dictated by its environment. So when we look here at these, what are called deidinases, there's three types, type 1, D1, T, D2, and D3. And these different enzymes will actually promote different flow of thyroid hormones. That's why many people that don't have cancer but are or uh, maybe having thyroid dysfunction, they may take zinc, they may take selenium, they may take chromium, they may take iodine, because these promote T4 to T3 conversion. These promote T4 to a more potent T3 thyroid hormone. Versus if you have mercury, if you have lead poisoning, can actually interfere with these enzymes and actually promote inactivation. Inflammation in cancer does the same thing. You'll see, low T, you'll see high T4, low T3, and high reverse T3. That is non-thyroidal uh, illness syndrome. It is essentially the inflammatory process, the bed in which cancer lies, that is disrupting other metabolic environments throughout the body here, thyroid, and that has huge impact throughout the body. Thyroid receptors, these are your classic genomic thyroid receptors, primarily TR-alpha is a promoting uh, the stimulating TR alpha, TR1 and 2, where T3 is binding and TR beta has more of a counter regulatory thought uh, activity, it's thought. So we can't forget about these receptors, though we're not going to talk about them much here. So when we look at what the actual process of genomic classical thyroid hormone signaling looks like, it's a process by which TRH from, uh, from the pituitary to stimulates uh, the thyroid to release TSH which moves down to stimulate thyroglobulin, which then takes on iodine, so you get iodination, and this then get, uh, leads to the production of T4, which is thyroglobulin with four iodine molecules. And then this is released into the circulation, where then via deiodinase 
as affected by its environment, again, environment is dictating the effect here, it's then allowing the conversion of T4 to T3 or to other thyroid hormones. And in turn, this is how cancer can manipulate its environment, use it for its advantage and our overall body's disadvantage. So let's go through each one of these thyroid hormones. So T4. T4 is often referred to as a pro-hormone. It, it has biological activity, but not a lot. It's actually a very abundant thyroid hormone, but biologically it's, it's definitely a weaker thyroid ho uh, hormone. It has weak thyroid receptor affinity when looking at this genomically. Again, weak biological activity. But it is the most thyroid hormone, and it is the primary thyroid hormone that is secreted from the thyroid gland. Contrast that with T3, the unsung hero, if you will. It is the principal intracellular thyroid hormone. It has the most potent thyroid activity, thyromimetic. It mimics, it has the most potent stimulating. It has very high affinity for the receptor of the thyroid, and it's primarily produced peripherally. So that T4 that's released circulates throughout the body. Somehow there's a signal that draws it to where it needs to go and it gets converted to T3 right near there where it acts. This T3 is very powerful and it turns around can actually suppress the upstream signaling. And so you can often see a suppression of TSH and T4 as a result of this very, very powerful thyroid hormone which you don't get from levothyroxine, you don't get from Synthroid. Everybody takes these products thinking, well, my body will make T3. Well, your body's not looking for T4, which is those, it, that's those synthetic products. And the assumption that the body's gonna make the active T3 out of those products is not correct either. Typically, the environment that creates the low T4 is the environment that's not gonna use it the right things. The analogy is that you take a box of matches, you, get them, you give them to a 10-year-old boy, he's probably gonna burn the house down. Whereas if you give matches to a 35-year-old young man, you shouldn't have to worry that they're gonna burn the house down. It's the environment, it's the individual, it's the processing. So when we look at reverse T3, referencing back to that first quote, it was that it's not active. It has no clinical relevance. I love this, high thyroid receptor affinity, so even though it's said to have no biological activity and dim, deemed clinically irrelevant, it has a very high thyroid receptor affinity. So thus by many, it's said to be an inactive thyroid hormone. Yet I think I've heard this pattern before, right? Your appendix, your tonsils. Well, no biological activity. It's clinically irrelevant until we happen to discover what that relevance is. So likewise here, we're starting to discover that relevance. So thus these quotes that there's no biological activity doesn't necessarily deem it's clinically irrelevant. In fact, it's an unknown exact clinical relevance. T2 is one that often never gets missed. And by the way, if you go to just a conventional straight up doc, you're, you're pretty much only gonna get a, a TSH, let alone anything beyond a TSH or a T4. So if, if you ask them about a T3 or a reverse T3, you're probably gonna get cross-eyed. Look, but so here we're looking at T2. Um, it's one that's again, exists, but time forgotten, never knew because nobody thinks about it. It's inert, it is a thyromimetic. It does stimulate and, and mimic thyroid activity. It has greater than 500 fold less thyroid receptor affinity. So it's very weak binding to the receptor and it's not really gonna suppress centrally, just like T3 will, and it's at least 100-fold less potent than T3 because of that affinity. So again, the steel is playing a role here, but not anything you're gonna see in testing, but understand there's things outside of your test results that are having a biological impact. So when we look at the non-genomic signaling, that's really what this talk is about, to think differently, to step back and understand that thyroid hormones particularly in cancer cells and in that environment, are gonna not necessarily work straight through into that genomic signaling pathway. And primarily it's gonna involve three different receptors. The integrin alpha V beta three, which by the way, spike proteins, they love that too, because that's heavily expressed on platelets. Hint, hint for the future webinar. 
Uh, and then two shorter thyroid receptors here, they're kind of fragmented thyroid receptors, so they're not the just classic genomic signaling, TR-alpha, delta, and then P30. These are just really short fragments. So these are basically signaling pathways that are, that are not directly going through thyroid receptors that thyroid hormones use. You can see that in the lower left-hand corner uh, with that little kind of green block. And then it actually affects signaling, internal cell signaling pathways that can affect genetic expression, but it's affecting cell signaling pathways within the cells, whether healthy or not. So here's just a good kind of uh, headache creating signaling pathway, looking at both, um, really here looking at non-genomic action. You see that at the top with the T4, T3 interacting with the alpha V beta three pathway. And then you can actually see the internal signaling that it's affecting. The uh, MAP, K, the MAP kinases, the ERKs, um, and also affecting estrogen receptors. So here you can actually have thyroid non-genomically actually stimulating estrogen receptor activity. So again, this kind of cross communication of hormones, everybody says, well, you know, I've got estrogen responsive cancer. I need to shut that down. And they forget that, hey, guess what? There's other things that can actually be involved here. The body is not just some you know, sequential, simplistic process. Again, recognize the complexity and move forward with it in a simplified plan. So there's lots of crosstalk between the genomic and non-genomic. There's changes in protein flows and protein trafficking. You know, here at uh, Brio Medical, we do a lot of proteomics and transcriptomic evaluation along with the genomics. Again, helping us to be precise and accurate in our assessment and in our treatment. This will affect proliferation, that's growth. It'll actually affect, block, or promote angiogenesis. This is that vascular supply growth that cancer needs. It'll affect glucose transport, whether that's affecting glucose transmitters, what's called GLUT, whether that's affecting hypoxia and how that's affecting the Warburg effect, and also affects lactate clearance. Lactate is kind of that, it's that acid that's a byproduct of Warburg effect that gets dumped out of the cancer cell into the periphery, and it creates a, a boundary, if you will, in the tumor microenvironment that's acidic and creates a buffer. Um, it can be used by the cancer too, but that's a talk for another day. And this crosstalk in this thyroid processing can also increase motility. Here I'm talking about motility, whereby the cancer goes from being immobile to mobile, and that's something we call metastasis. So in any patient with estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, this could be ovarian, this could be lung, this could even be something like colon cancer because they can express this. T4 can actually, via this non-genomic signal, mimic the downstream effect of estrogen without the estrogen receptor. So just <clears throat> blow the minds. So looking at then signaling here, this non-genomic thyroid receptor, endocrine alpha V beta three, can actually stimulate hypoxia signaling. And hypoxia in turns around, drives cancer growth, and these are some of the many internal signaling pathways, nuclear factor kappa beta, VEGF, matrix metalloproteinases, epithelium to mesenchymal transition, that's immobile to mobile, GLUT1, that is uptake of sugar, by the way, that also uptakes vitamin C. So you see how cancer can really manipulate its environment to really self-feed itself. Inflammation begets cancer, cancer begets inflammation. And that's really kind of what we're seeing here. Hypoxia uh, begets uh, metabolic dysfunction, here, non-genomic thyroid signaling dysfunction, and that begets hypoxia. And you get self-feeding cycles that really allow cancer then to take a life on of its own. So this crosstalk between T4 and T3 in these non-genomic signaling actually promotes inflammation or can block inflammation, can promote angiogenesis, proliferation, survival, immune escape, physical escape, and then epithelial and mesenchymal transition, which is really important because that's how metastasis occurs, which is 90% of morbidity and mortality associated with cancer. Now, all of this can be caused through this non-genomic signaling. 
and I know this is technical, so if you're getting a headache, I'm sorry, but this is helping, I hope, to empower you through knowledge to better attack thyroid, to better attack the cancer. There are certain thyroid here, thyroid hormones here, that can promote this procarcinogenic signaling process, but there's also one that can be used against it. Now, to show you how, how hot, of a hot of a topic this is, I'm sure this was a scintillating conference where they came together to talk about, let's rename this nomenclature, this process, to type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, instead of genomic versus non-genomic signaling. I'm sure that was a barn beating, barn door burning conference. Just probably couldn't, probably really exciting. But, so just to show you, there's lots of talk and conversation out there about this process and the understanding of the impact is really growing. So I'm gonna back up a little bit and look at this non-genomic T4 signaling. So looking at T4, which you're going to get from the levothyroxine, you're gonna get from the Synthroid, and it is the most bioavailable, but the weakest thyroid compared to T3. This T4 binds to that integrin alpha V beta 3, and it actually increases program death ligand 1. This is important because this is a mechanism by which cells will express this protein, this ligand, that allows it to evade the immune system. Hmm. I think cancer could take use of that, right? It's a mechanism to prevent the immune system from attacking itself. Here, cancer takes a normal defensive mechanism and uses it for its benefit and the detriment of the body. Likewise, it will bind to the same receptor and increase uh, B cell and T cell lymphocyte attenuator. It increases cyclin D1, which promotes mitotic progression. It decreases BCL2, so it, it really changes the signaling so as to inhibit apoptosis. It's going to induce ERK-1-2 activation, again, signaling that promotes growth. It's going to increase VEGF, and it's going to increase matrix metalloproteinase, so vascular endothelial growth factor, vascular matrix metalloproteinases, MMMPs, that's going to promote invasion. This is via T4. T4, which many people are taking. T4, which many people with cancer are taking. And research shows, again, 2019, it may be stimulating the cancer. Continuing on, the, I, the thyroid receptor, the alpha beta alpha V beta three receptor actually has a higher affinity for T3 versus T4 versus T3. And that's important because T3 is a way that we can counter that. So if T4 and T3 are present, T4 is actually gonna to bind to that receptor with higher affinity and stimulate all that pro-cancer effect. And that integrin alpha V beta three is highly expressed in cancer cells and platelets. And this really promotes a cancer relevant endothelial cell signaling to promote metastasis. It promotes platelet aggregation. When cancer cells are released from the primary tumor, they're surrounded by platelets in what's called a platelet cell cancer aggregate. And this creates a ball of protection as it floats systemically, looking for a place to land, and that's protecting it against the immune system. This also provides resistance to radiation and is anti-apoptotic, and apoptosis is programmed cell death. This is T4, thyroid hormone, stimulating cancer processes non-genomically. Thyroid hormone action on cancer cells is defined primarily as T4 at the cell surface alpha V beta 3 receptor, non-genomically. So blockade of the T4 at that receptor will actually inhibit human cancer in vivo in vitro growth of cancer as well as blocking the associated angiogenesis. Again, we want to be precise, we want to be accurate we can actually block this signaling pathway, not just see the positive, but actually see the negative. Not see the pro, but see the inhibitory effect of the elimination of that T4 signaling. And reducing of T4 in solid tumor patients has actually been shown to arrest tumor cell growth. Read that again. Reducing serum T4 in patients with solid tumor, solid tumors, you can actually see arrest of tumor cell growth. Don't, don't take my word for it. There'll be some quotes upcoming. This is from 2015. Spontaneously or medically reduced levels of T4 in blood 
in non-thyroidal illness syndrome is this is in the setting of cancer are desirable and here these authors say we've advocated pharmacological reduction of circulating t4 in patients with cancer regardless of baseline levels of t4 the reduction of t4 levels has de desirable effects on tumor behavior that's desirable effects of healthy cells undesirable effects of tumor behavior. Here they're looking at glioblastomas in a phase one, phase two study out of anti-cancer research, a little bit older here, 2003. Now we talked about T4, which most of us are aware of because of Synthroid and Levothyroxine, but non-genomic reverse T3, that's that one that's deemed as clinically irrelevant until now. We now know it's biologically active. It's not biologically inactive. They just weren't looking in the right place. It's like looking at the tree with apples and thinking gravity doesn't exist until the tree falls on your head. So circulating levels of reverse T3 increase in non thyroidal illness syndrome. And it's because of that inflammatory process that is driving cancer and cancer is in turn driving. And this reverse T3 acts on that same receptor as T4 to actually stimulate growth. And it does so by increasing the influx of calcium into that cancer cell. And it promotes invasion, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, and promoting the metastatic spread. What about T3? So we talked about T4, we talked about reverse T3 and how they're interacting in this non-genomic process to help cancer grow. Well, T3 has significantly less affinity for that non-genomic receptor, alpha V beta 3 uh, receptor. T3 is not actually a functional ligand at that receptor. And it doesn't appear to support cancer growth unless in really, really high dose. Advanced cl clinical cancer can actually be managed therapeutically, here I've got pharmacologically, by substituting T4 therapy with T3. And this will actually inhibit this process by which cancers, cancer cells move from immobile to mobile, epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is really a key transitionary process in how its behavior, its pathways, its, its expression of proteins will allow it to move and become mobile and thus evade physically and evade immunologically. Again, just understanding the context here and the impacts on the immune system. I always tell everybody the answer to cancer is don't get it. Obviously, that's the easy answer, but the answer to cancer, if you get it, is the immune system, and we can actually impact that immune system via thyroid. Here it's looking at, particularly you want to focus on the natural killer cells. T3 will increase natural killer cell activity, whereas uh, too much thyroid will decrease it and then dendritic cell activity, which are very important in promoting um, antigen presentation and involvement of the immune system locally and systemically. So when we look at the non-genomic anti-cancer effects, T3 only therapy in patients with cancer reduces tumor growth, reduces primary tumor, and reduces metastasis metastatic signaling. This has been shown in breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, in vitro and vivo studies. 2018 quote from a very mainstream journal, mainstream journal, not gerbil, but journal, the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Quote, thyroid hormone receptor on integrin alpha V beta 3, which is critically important to cancer cell proliferation, think growth, is capable of binding T4 and T3, but T4 acts at this site at physiologic concentrations to promote proliferation, whereas T3 enhances tumor cell division only at concentrations above physiologic levels. Possible benefit of T3 administration to achieve physiological normal circulating levels in the management of certain cancers. So what they're saying is here, hey, we can use T3 to actually affect cancer cells, actually affect cancer cell growth and growth potential because of its non-genomic effects. So 2015 article I've referenced before, loss of tumor mass can occur in patients whom T4 was used pharmacologically to reduce 
which was T4 was reduced pharmacologically and to whom T3 has been administered to maintain the euthyroid state. So what they did is they actually gave T3, they reduced T4, and they saw a reduction in tumor mass. T3 at physiological levels does not stimulate tumor cell proliferation at the alpha V beta 3 receptor, non-genomically. Now, if you overstimulate it, yes, you could see that, but that's why you have to treat, that's why you have to reassess. Nobody would go to their doctor uh, for high blood pressure and say, Doc, I think I have high blood pressure, and then the doctor just puts you on a blood pressure medicine. They're going to evaluate you, they're going to look for cause, or they should. They're going to then introduce therapy, and they are going to then reassess you. And that reassessment is a necessary ongoing effect. So really important uh, article here from the oncologist. Uh, what they did is they looked at a small study of 23 and a compassion need observational study in terminal patients. I don't know why they always wait till terminal to do these patients, these patients that were deemed incurable. And they were actually able to extend survival in these patients with this study by inducing hypothyroxinemia, that is lowering the T4 with T3. 83%, 83% of subjects exceeded the expected survival. Now, we want to do better than that, but the point here is they're simply lowering the T4 and raising the T3. That's it. That's all they're doing. And they were able to increase the survival. The survival time of these 83 patients, that's 19 of 23s, exceeded the 20% expected one-year survival for end-stage cancer groups. In few patients, Radiologically documented tumor responses were associated with clinical improvement shortly after simply stopping exogenous T4 supplementation, synthroid levothyroxine. So simply stopping T4 therapy showed imaging-wise, ultrasound-wise, CT-wise, MRI-wise, simply a reduction in the tumor size. So non-thyroidal illness syndrome really is just simply a reflection of the environment that is in a way allowed cancer to develop. Again, inflammation, chronic inflammation is the bed in which cancer lies. Cancer in turn produces inflammation and that inflammatory process again starts to ripple through the rest of the body and create dysfunction. And it's that balance that really can favor healing versus favor the cancer's growth. And what ends up happening is you end up with a maybe high normal T4, or above normal T4, a low T3, or a very low normal T3, and a high reverse T3. And this is a reflection of a sick performing thyroid that the cancer can use, being manipulated by the environment that cancer is growing in, and that the cancer in turn is creating itself. Move on, won't talk about T2 much. So there's all kinds of crosstalk here. Again, blow in the mind as it relates to thyroid hormones and cancer. Here we're actually talking about crosstalk on a much bigger level. Those endocrine alpha V beta 3 receptors that are increased in cancer, that T4 and reverse T3 stimulate, that T3 can inhibit, they promote estrogen receptor alpha. So you can actually not have estrogen and the thyroid, if you're taking levothyroxine T4, you can actually promote that estrogen receptor. So anybody out there with estrogen respo uh, re uh, responsive cancers, you need to look at the thyroid hormone you're taking. You need to look at your thyroid hormones. It promotes inflammation. It increases that programmed death ligand one, which, which is expressed by cancer cells to evade the immune system. And it stimulates many different oncogenes. So it's a tale of two environments. In the tumor microenvironment, we have a non-thyroidal receptor independent signaling pathway. The question is, is it non-genomic dominant in this tumor microenvironment, or is it just 50-50? The point is, in non-tumor environments, this is a very low biologically utilized pathway. In the tumor microenvironment, T4 and reverse T3 dominating, and here's the kicker. By bypassing these receptors, this genomic classic signaling, it becomes very fast signaling. You're bypassing all these checkpoints, these regulatory points. And so you look at it from a cancer perspective, it's that there's an advantage. You can bypass all these points of obstruction of regulation and then just move right to growth. Whereas T3, 
can actually block this. So non-tumor microenvironment, it is primarily a thyroid receptor dominant. It's genomic, it's T3 dominant, and it's a much slower signaling. The impact is oncogenic transformation, oncogenic metabolic shift, oncogenic signaling, immune escape, metastasis, and resistance to treatment. But in and of itself, the proper use of thyroid through the proper use of thyroid testing, you can use thyroid as a treatment. Again, we want to be precise. We want to be accurate because that's what the evidence says. So let's just let the science lead the way and we follow it in our conclusions. It's one thing to think. It's quite another to change the way we think. We need to get rid of group thinking and start focus on critically thinking. So I hope that this has kind of expanded your mind. Again, we want to be teachers that heal through the use of integrative medicine. That's what we want to do. That's what I do here as medical director at Brio Medical, and that's what our team does here. So if you'd like to learn more about what time or your time here would look like in treatment in a process to heal with cancer, I encourage you to schedule a free consultation. Uh, got the number there, got the web address there. Uh, check that out and you'll be able to connect with our patient care coordinators. And uh, hopefully uh, we don't need to talk to you, but if you do, we will do everything of what we discussed here and many other things to provide precision, accurate, targeted, holistic, natural, and integrative therapies to teach your body how to heal. So I hope that's been helpful. So um, that is pretty much what I've got. There's our awesome team. So, and I am not standing on a stool. So hope that was helpful. Now what I want to do is open it up to any questions that you may have. Okay, what is resveratrol used for? I saw that name at the top of one of your slides. Yeah, so resveratrol, uh, classically it's an, it's an antioxidant. Uh, most people look at it, you know, coming from red grapes. But resveratrol can actually be used to actually uh, slow that receptor pathway signaling. So inflammation is in many cases what's driving the change of function of these enzymes. So think, you know, if there's inflammation present, it's going to upregulate deiodinase type 3, which instead of T4 getting converted to T3, it gets converted to reverse T3, and that reverse T3 binds to that non-genomic hormone signaling, and it's going to then promote cancer growth, as, we've, as I've mentioned, showed you in the studies. Resveratrol, as a antioxidant, reducing inflammation is a way to counter that, as could be curcumin, as could be anything that could reduce that inflammation. So that's what that was essentially showing. I have stage four prostate cancer presently on Lupron and a Abiraterone. I don't know who comes up with these names, but I take Armour Thyroid 60 milligrams per day. Yeah, Lynn, uh, that, that's something that you should change. Um, I would recommend you know, seeking out an integrated practitioner to look at your thyroid hormone, uh, your thyroid hormones, and uh, get that process changed. How do you optimize thyroid in cancer patients? Um, test, treat, evaluate. That, that's really what it is. Um, you look at it. Some patients uh, will get T3 and recognize that it's a reflection, really, of the environment. So. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to always be on T3 or always be on some form of thyroid support. Um, as long as the environment is there that favors this dysfunction, it needs to be uh, intervened upon. Don't do telemedicine visits. That's a good question. Um, so, um, yeah, it's something that maybe in the future we'll bring, but we just don't currently at this point. Do you integrate the use of essential oils in your therapies against thyroid functions? Good question. I love essential oils. You know, they're, they're beyond just smelling good. You know, there's a, you know, gold incense and myrrh. Frankincense, Boswellia, is the incense. And the anti-cancer, the research on the anti-cancer benefits of Boswellia or frankincense are, are really powerful. And in fact, there's a study that looked at uh, people receiving radiation for tumors in the brain and that the use of boswellia at a very high dose orally actually was equal to the use of dexamethasone a steroid in reducing the edema associated uh, with the treatment of those tumors in the brain from radiation. So essential oils, very powerful, and yes, we use them. 
Lyothyronine is a synthetic T3 and helps fight cancer. No, lyothyronine, yes, okay, yes. Yeah, lyothyronine is T3. It's also known as Cytomel. There is a, there used to be a compounding T3. I haven't used it in so long, so I don't know if it exists. It actually came from duck feathers, believe it or not. I don't know how somebody would come up with that. But uh, T3, uh, there it was just not very reliable. So uh, Cytomel is a synthetic T3. Uh, it is a commercially available product, and, and that is what I'm talking about. Yes, Marie. Good to talk to you, Marie. What do you replace synthetic with in cancer patients? If you're, if you're ref referencing the T4, I just, if, if I find that the, particularly if CRP or SED rate is elevated, this, these are systemic inflammatory markers. If I see the T4 kind of above that 50th percentile or above normal, which I see quite a bit, and the reverse T3 low, and that's very, that free T3 low and that reverse T3 high, and that's what you'll commonly see. You see the T4 on the high side of normal, very high side, the T3 below normal, and the reverse T3 above normal. When you see the high T3, low T3, excuse me, high T4, low T3, and reverse and high reverse T3, that with elevated inflammatory markers requires requires an intervention of T3 to lower the T4, kind of right around that low normal level, or maybe slightly below and then get that T3 up in the normal range, typically around 3.2 to 3.5, re bring that reverse T3 down and, and then work in other areas to bring down those inflammatory markers. So that's, that's really the process in which that happens. If somebody has normal T4, reverse T3 is normal, and uh, free T3 is normal, I, I won't intervene there. So it, it has to be dictated by the environment. Now, what I've seen is with advanced, advanced stage three, stage four cancer. Most of them are coming in with obviously very progressive situations. This environment, this processing has moved much more systemically, much more broader. So we often, to see, we often see those patients with much, much, much greater degrees of non-thyroidal illness syndrome. Also, since you mentioned vitamin C, what's the difference between ascorbic acid and sodium ascorbate as it relates to treatment? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, sodium ascorbate is actually a pH neutral form. It's uh, much better tolerated than ascorbic acid, whereas ascorbic acid is very acidic in its pH. It has to have uh, buffers added to it. Uh, so when you're using high dose vitamin C, Marine, um, the sodium ascorbate is a much more toler much better tolerated uh, therapy because of the B pH. People would say, well, you can buffer it, and that's true. You add things like sodium bicarb. The problem there is my experience is even when you add in the buffer agents, you still can achieve the more neutral pH of 7.3 to 7.35 you see with the sodium ascorbate over the ascorbic acid. Of course, um, I'm also the um, um, Chief Scientific Medical Advisory for the Vitamin C International Consortium Institute where we advocate for the use of sodium ascorbate in the treatment of cancer as the science dictates. As the science dictates, let me spit that out. Somebody asking that they have a spot on the left lung the size of a quarter that showed up on a PET CT scan. They wanted to do a biopsy. I don't want to have it done. So, Sandy, good question. Here's the issue. I, I mentioned this in an analogy earlier where a patient comes in with high blood pressure and they say, I have high blood pressure. And the doctor says, oh, okay. And proceeds to then write you for a prescription. And you go, well, wait, wait a second, aren't you going to check my blood pressure? No, 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 I, I take your word for it. The question is, you know, how high is it? Is it high at all? Is it mildly high? What's going on? So it's always good to know what you're dealing with. There are those that say cancer is cancer is cancer. Now, I understand what they're trying to say, but what they're saying is actually inaccurate. Cancer is unique. You can take two patients with the same cancer. I had a, a new patient come in today with triple negative breast cancer, and she recently lost a good friend, childhood friend, that also had triple negative breast cancer. And each one of those cancer types, though the same name, going to behave very differently. So we need to know what we're dealing with. Though nobody likes a biopsy, 
though conventional medicine will tell you that biopsies are completely safe, they have small risk. But the benefit, the upside here, helps us to understand what we're dealing with with this cancer. Not only that, we can actually look at genomic and proteomic and transcriptomic evaluation of these tumors, and we can actually guide natural, holistic, and integrative treatments based on that. So we can have an understanding of what we're dealing with. It's, instead of driving a car blindfolded, we can actually have vision, have sight, and thus have direction. So, though nobody wants that, there are ways and techniques to protect against risk associated with biopsies. If done properly, it can really mitigate that risk. Now, I'm not an advocate of going in there and sticking a needle in everything you see everywhere, but it helps us to understand what we're dealing with to help provide the best foot forward and the best treatment strategy moving forward. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it'd be great if we, you can get resveratrol from a glass of wine, but there's lots of sugars, there's lots of chemicals in there, so you are correct. You are correct. Um, so, but iodine, absolutely iodine helps with uh, breast cancer. Iodine's really great for the immune system. Of course, uh, when, you, when you reference the T4, T3, T2s, there's even a T0 and T1. That is referenced, the number is the reference of the number of iodine molecules attached to the thyroid globulin molecule. And uh, so, the thyroid obviously concentrates iodine the most in the body, but the breast is number two. I had invasive ductal carcinoma breast cancer, but I had lumpectomy. I had low T3, but tried 60 milligrams a day. Ooh, that's, if you were taking 60 milligrams of T3, that was a lot. Um, you may be talking about armor thyroid, which is T4, T3. And I felt brain fog, sick in my stomach, and wanted to cry for the third day, so I stopped. Should I take a reduced form half amount to prevent recurrence of breast cancer? Um, you know, the question there is what thyroid are you taking? Um, I'm a guessing based on that dosing, 60 milligrams, that's, that's armor. Absolutely, I would recommend um, not taking the armor, but actually taking a low dose, of T, low dose form of T3 uh, versus the T4, because if it's armor, which is typically 60 milligrams, that would be a T4, T3 combination. Cannabis and cancer, why every cancer patient should be incorporating THC? Uh, not every cancer patient, Lyndon, uh, and, and I hope that I'm, I'm not mispronouncing that. Um, check out the previous uh, webinar that's on, on our YouTube channel. There are some cancer types that uh, THC should not be used in, but there are many types that THC absolutely can have, been, have benefit in. So in understanding the tumor type, again, cancer is cancer is cancer is not correct, helps to dictate what cannabinoid to use here. THC is a cannabinoid, CBD is a cannabinoid, uh, but also the type of cancer, the behavior. Not only can it affect the cancer growth, you can use it against the cancer, and I document all the different mechanisms of which you can do that in the pri prior webinar last week, but also it can be great to help in a variety of symptoms associated with cancer. Can all treatments be used in conjunction with the uh, RGCC protocol? You know, they can. Um, th those aren't protocols that we use here. Um, they can. They can be used there. Talking about ascorbic acid versus sodium ascorbate. Yeah, so, you know, this is, of course, different topic, but, you know, I think some of it is the difference between, you know, what we do here at Brio Medical is is cancer. That's all we do, and we're in the research, and we we have we work to develop relationships with other providers across the world, let alone here in the U.S. to provide the best for patients. So sodium ascorbate, when we're dosing vitamin C therapeutically in the treatment of cancer, it can become a natural and holistic therapy that can become tough to deal with, and part of that is related to the high dose requiring the long infusion time. And if you have a pH acidic solution with ascorbic acid, not properly buffered, you're gonna get a lot of symptoms associated with that. And especially if you're just using a peripheral line. Whereas sodium ascorbate, which is pH neutral, is incredibly well tolerated comparatively. Now, I don't wanna say exclusively, you know, so absolutely, because there's always uniqueness amongst individuals, but I can tell you using high dose in the treatment of cancer, Sodium ascorbate is far better, far better than ascorbic acid 
in the treatment of cancer with vitamin C. So, so I hope that was helpful. Went through a bunch of this. Now I get to go have dinner with my daughter, my daughter-in-law, my son, and my wife and daughter. So I hope this has been helpful, empowering. Check out the webinar, rewatch it. Check out some of those studies. Uh, dive into it, read it yourself. Uh, a lot of it's very technical, deep, but I think it empowers you to really take control and steer your healing because that's what you need. It's your body, it's your life, it's your direction. So it's your process of healing. It's your bold mission. Take it and run with it. Hope you have a good evening and a fantastic Thanksgiving next week.